The title of my talk is Committed to Aid Armenia and the Exclusionary State Centrism in Soviet Armenia's Diaspora Policies in 1920s and 1930s. What I'm going to present in my brief paper um, is part of a larger argument that I'm developing in a book lab project on nation states and their diaspora policies. Many academic studies on state diaspora policies remain confined to methodologically nationalist perspectives in which nation states are taken as natural forms of contemporary social world and state centrism therefore is taken for granted in states relations with diasporas. My approach will challenge these perspectives by suggesting that state centrism has in fact detrimental effects on diaspora. It's counterproductive to building long-term and sustainable relations with diasporas. In my 20 minutes here, of course, I'm not gonna make this argument because this is for a book. By examining the policies of pursued by the early leaders of Soviet Armenia toward the incipient post-genocide Armenian diaspora and the politicizing mission of the Committee to Aid Armenia, um, I propose that three factors, political rivalries, ideological differences, and the Soviet's exclusive focus on the state's needs became inconducive for building more constructive relations with Armenian organizations abroad. For the Committee to Aid Armenia, I'm going to use the, the acronym HOG, Hayastani Okunsan Komite, for the shortness. I argue that in their targeting many influential Armenians abroad and in their active involvement in the diaspora through the chapters of HOK, the leaders in Yerevan in fact pursued state-centered, aggressive and exclusionary diaspora policy. Because of time constraint, I will present this argument by focusing on some important publications by early leaders of Soviet Armenia, which shaped the policies towards the Armenians and Armenian organizations outside the Soviet space and which redefined the Hulk mission accordingly. In my brief talk, I will have to skip the details of the tensions that mounted between the emerging Hulk chapters in France and the US and other Armenian organizations in the 20s and 30s with their detrimental effects on local Armenian communities. On September 13, 1921, the newly created Ayastani Okunsan Komite or Committee to Aid Armenia issued an appeal to the Armenian people in the diaspora, which read in part, I quote, to the Armenian people dispersed in four corners of the world. Listen, the committee to aid Armenia is calling upon you. The council of Armenian activists of all currents and literary scholars convened in the capital of Armenia is appealing to you. The free and independent Armenia is finally rising. Today, Hoke announces to all the Armenians everywhere that peace has established in our homeland and she is in peaceful and harmonious relations with its old neighboring peoples. The government has mobilized all its resources to help people survive the prevailing and anticipated famine in particular and to rebuild the destroyed country. At a time when the neighboring proletarian peoples extend their hand of brotherly assistance to the Armenian workers today, when the American people continue their aid with greater effort is it possible for you to remain indifferent to her sufferings and efforts of construction? You, her migrant exiled brother, you who are far from the homeland, it is impossible. Hoke realizes perfectly well that you two are divided along various political party lines, just as any people in a political and civil society. Hoke itself is made up of people of various political persuasions, but it is fully aware that saving Armenians from starvation and rebuilding the destroyed Armenia are above all political disagreements. And it is with such reasoning that they have all rallied around this noble cause, formed an independent and a nonpartisan public body and invite everybody to action. A flag mind is go the government of Armenia's Soviet Republic, which not only grants full rights for action, but also supports everybody and every organization, all those who want to help. Now, listen Armenians, Wherever you are, from Europe to America, Egypt to India, and everywhere else, hear the call of the homeland and ask them to help any way you can so that you may achieve what you have dreamed for centuries, a free and prosperous homeland. End of talk. The government of Soviet Armenia, headed by Alexander Miasnikyan at the time, formally endorsed the creation of the Committee to Aid Armenia two days later on September 15, 1921. A few years later, however, Miasnikyan and other leaders of Soviet Armenia redefined Soviet Armenia's policies, also revising the inclusive messaging of Hoke, 
which began reflecting their political rivalry with the former government of independent Armenia, their ideological differences with other influential Armenian organizations in the diaspora, and their exclusive interest in the state building efforts in Soviet Armenia. In November 1924, Alexander Miasnikian published a book titled Political Parties Among Migrant Armenians or Diaspora Armenians, which outlined the relations of the Bolsheviks with the Armenian political parties. Published in the aftermath of the Conference of Lausanne, when Soviet Armenia remained the one and only Armenian state, Miasnikian condemned with added confidence Armenian nationalism, the Armenian nationalist political parties, setting the stage for Soviet Armenia's exclusionary policies against them, all of which were now operating outside Soviet Armenia. I quote, there are two opposing poles in Armenian life, communism and nationalism, or Bolshevism and Dashnakism. The former is the new Armenia, the latter is the old Armenia. The former is our revolution, our present, and moreover, our future. The latter is the regressive life of Armenians, the bad path which is breathing its last. The Armenian Revolutionary Federation, established in 1819 in Tiflis, was the rival party of the Bolshevik government of Armenia, the party which governed the independent Republic of Armenia before the Bolshevik takeover in December 1920. The unsuccessful revolt the RF had attempted in February, April 1921, escalated the mutual intolerance between the Bolsheviks and the ARF. Yasnikian's portrayal of the ARF reflected and also shaped the general attitudes among Soviet Armenian elites and the policy based on the exclusion of the ARF leaders and rank of file members. Yasnikian did not spare the other Armenian diasporic quote unquote nationalist parties as well, namely the Liberal Democratic Ramgavar Party and the Social Democratic Hunchakyan Party. He defined the Liberal Democratic Ramgavars as another opposite pole to the Bolshevism even if in his mind they were more peaceful compared to the ARF. I quote, the Ramgavars and the Bolsheviks are, are also opposite poles, regardless of the fact that one of the poles has some temporary sympathy towards the other, the confrontation will always continue, end of quote. Miastikian did not even consider the social democratic Hunchakians as a political party, reasoning that the Hunchakians had been strong until 1897, for about a decade since their founding, and had declined afterwards, yielding their place to the era. Within a year after Miasnikian's publication, Ashot Hovanisyan, another prominent leader of Soviet Armenia, who was the first secretary of the Communist Party and the de facto administrative head of the country, published a 23 pages long proposal to rethink the policies towards the Armenian organizations and masses abroad. He overtly celebrated the defeat of Armenian nationalism at the Lausanne Conference and envisioned more exclusionary policies towards the Armenian organizations in Europe and elsewhere, which included more specific instructions for HOK and its emerging chapters outside the Soviet Union. Hovanistan's account began with the review of Soviet Armenia's policies towards the Armenian refugees and migrants, policies which he called or inconsistently, which I translate as policy towards the Armenian migrant or refugee communities abroad. I quote, our connection with the Armenian um, colonies Garutnesh, has been one-sided. We've always dealt with the Armenian bourgeoisie. The Armenian bourgeoisie abroad has abused this fact as a monopoly to shape and lead public opinion of the masses. We need to rethink our policies and think about more direct ways of influencing public opinion among the Armenian, Armenian masses abroad. And the fourth. In rethinking Soviet policies, he reasserted the boundaries between them and the ARF on the one hand and between them and the Ramkavars and other Armenian organizations on the other. In reference to the ARF, Hovanisan wrote, I quote, there is no breach that can be extended over the gap which has been created between the ongoing anti-revolutionary activism and the expanding revolution. Nor is there a goal which could create a collaboration between us and our opponents who were thrown out of the country by the bloody civil war." End of quote. He instructed the Armenian workers among the ARF ranks to leave the party if they wanted to join their efforts to the reconstruction projects in Armenia. Then, turning to the Ramgavars, he continued. 
I quote, we should continue our relations with the Armenian bourgeoisie abroad. However, we should do this not because we're hoping to receive some significant aid from those organizations, but for the opposite reason, in order to show the Armenian masses that we have never received such assistance, despite the fact that we did not severe our relations with the Armenian bourgeoisie, despite the fact that their promises and announcements about providing aid to Armenia have never stopped. End of quote. Kovanistan suggested to continue negotiating with, with the Armenian bourgeoisie and their organizations for the sole purpose of transferring the funds raised and collected by these organizations to their rightful owner, Soviet Armenia. Suggesting an exclusionary state centrist agenda, he declared, I quote, there are national properties and funds in the colonies abroad whose sole and rightful owner is most certainly Soviet, Soviet Armenia. Charitable and other donations are collected in the colonies, which in one way or another are done in the name of Soviet Armenia, end of quote. Therefore, they had to resort to whatever means to bring those funds to Armenia, even if that would lead to an eventual downfall of Armenian organizations abroad. Moreover, for Hovhannisan, the eventual breakdown of the Armenian bourgeoisie abroad was also a political and ideological goal to be pursued. I quote, there are internal disagreements within the bourgeoisie and they are getting even sharper. We need to aggravate as much as possible the gap that exists between the nationalistic political parties. We need to use that disunity because indeed that disunity helps our cause." End of quote. As an example of the abundant funds that were not entirely sent to Soviet Armenia, he referred to the Armenian General Benevolent Union, a charitable organization established in 1906 in Egypt by Boros Nubar Pasha, a notable Armenian from Egypt. As Hovhannisan explained, the AGBU, which had some influential Ramgavars among its leaders, used the profits generated from the endowments of about 1 million British pounds to do some minor projects for Armenian refugees and orphans in the Middle East, while many of its leaders lived a lavish life. The Soviet proposal of moving the endowment funds to Soviet Armenia or sending their profits to Soviet Armenia for the care of Armenian refugees and orphans remained unaddressed uh, per Hovhannisyan's assessment. Therefore, he concluded, I quote, our negotiations with the Ramgavar bourgeoisie over the problem of Armenian refugees and orphans are pointless conversations, which only serve them for gaining political capital at the expense of orphans and refugees. The policy of the Ramkavar bourgeoisie virtually harmonizes with the Dashnak behavior. Differences are in the formalities. Moreover, the explicit opposition of the ARF to the Soviet rule is no more dangerous than the Ramkavar's fake friendship. We need to take away the monopoly of the Armenian bourgeoisie over controlling the national properties and funds. We need to use those resources to solve the problems of refugees and orphans." End of quote. After outlining the country's general policy orientations, Hovhannisan redefined the mission of Hope and its emerging chapters in the diaspora as follows. I quote, Hope has a number of branches abroad. However, until now, Hope's foreign branches have served as organizations subjected to these Ramgavar manipulations to which the Armenian bourgeoisie threw some pennies to Soviet Armenia and conducted their policies towards the orphans and refugees. Hope collected about 300,000 rubles in the past three years of its existence, but which figure can express the political influence that the Ramkavar bourgeoisie had gained for such a low price among the Armenian masses abroad? To refine our position towards the Armenian bourgeoisie and towards its charity, we need quite naturally to consider the problem of reconstructing Hope first and foremost. Hope should stop serving as an arena for the consolidation of the national living forces, national classes, and political parties. It should turn into an organ for organizing the masses of proletariat and should contribute to the class stratification of the nation. It is necessary that Hope branches abroad turn into Armenian grassroots Langvatsain organizations. End of quote. Miasnikyan's and Hovhannisyan's account appearing within less than a year reflected both the political rivalries between the Bolsheviks and the more influential Armenian diasporic political parties and the ideology of class struggle. To implement this revised mission, Hoke's Central Committee dispatched a delegation in November 1925 
which spent about 13 months among Armenians in various parts of Europe and the United States until December 1926, recruiting supporters and establishing Hoke chapters abroad. The class stratification of the nation that the emerging Hoke chapters in France, Greece, Egypt, the United States aggressively pursued created much tensions and conflicts among local Armenian communities and organizations. Shortly after his return, Garen Mikhailian, one of the members of the Hoke delegation, published a report book titled Armenian National Wealth Abroad, Wills, Gifts, and Public Funds. As if instructed to provide evidence to Ashot Hovanisian's claims, Mikhailian described with figures the wills and donations made by wealthy Armenians to various causes and the funds owned by the Armenian organizations abroad to conclude that a tiny portion of those wealthy resources went to the noble cause of reconstructing Armenia. He estimated, for example, that the AGVU had spent only 8.4% of its total income of the past 20 years on projects benefiting Soviet Armenia while more than 90% of it was spent outside Armenia. In the section devoted to the AGBU, he quoted a small passage from the special issue of the AGBU organ, Miutsun, dedicated to its 20th anniversary, which announced, I quote, if you want to serve the cause of Soviet Armenia's reconstruction and, and the rebirth of Armenians by sacrifice, give your contribution to the AGBU, end of quote. From over 76 pages long anniversary special issue, which detailed the AGBU's activism from 1906 until 1926, Mikhailian carefully selected the tiny text of the announcement from page 43, which served well to the question he asked rhetorically in the name of Soviet Armenia. I quote, what are you doing with the funds collected in my name and where do you spend it? Political rivalries, ideological differences, but also the exclusive focus on the state's needs or the state centrism in the policies of Soviet Armenia, as I suggest here, eroded Soviet Armenia's relations not only with their political and ideological rivals, the LRF and the Ramgavars, but also with the Armenian General Benevolent Union. With little regard for what the AGBU had accomplished in the past decades, even before the creation of Soviet Armenia, and what it, had, what it had been doing for the Armenian refugees and orphans in Europe and the Middle East. And despite its ongoing support to Soviet Armenia, the exclusionary policies of Soviet Armenian officials expanded to target the AGBU and more personally, its leaders as well. In a significant escalation of the exclusionary policies, Agassi Khanjian, one of the successors of Ashut Hovanisyan as the first secretary of the Communist Party of Armenia, accused Carlos Gulbenkian personally, the president of the AGBU, in mismanagement of the AGBU funds for sponsoring the RF projects and for allegedly serving foreign anti-revolutionary powers in their subversive activism in Syria against Soviet Armenia. In a speech given on October 14, 1931, Kanjan made the following remarks, quote, the practical steps taken by the Dashnaks in their attempts to create an Armenian national home in Syria, which are, by the way, done with the direct sponsorship of the Gulbenkians, who are close to the Anglo-French imperialist factions and which are opposed to our plan to repatriate the Armenian workers abroad to Soviet Armenia, are aimed at providing a loyal force to a French imperialism for their colonial exploitation of Syria and for suppressing the national liberation movements of local populations. Those are also done for the purpose of supplying cheap labor to the oil fields and oil pipeline of the Gulbenkians, end of quote. These allegations eventually led to Gulbenkians' resignation about six months later. During those six months, the AGB Central Committee had made several unsuccessful attempts, hoping to convince the Soviet leaders and Hanjian himself to revisit and recall his remarks against the AGB and its president. Gulbenkian's resignation letter dated on April 22, 1932, read in part, quote, a new unexpected event happens to disturb the peace in the AGBU. The Yerevan government's official representative, Mr. Khanjan, has made insults against me with his baseless accusations. We expected in vain that the government of Armenia would refute the completely unnecessary attack. Therefore, I, as the president, 
am obliged to resign considering that the AGBU is necessarily involved with the government of Yerevan in many projects and that under the current circumstances, I cannot have a relationship with them as president with my name and my signature. I think I'm running out of time, so let me conclude. Um, the Soviet leaders in Armenia and the emerging hope chapters were pursuing policies within the broader context of class struggle with an eventual hope that the socialist revolution would spread around the, around the world in many countries through the communist parties and workers' movements. Political rivalry and this ideology were central in their policies with the Armenian political parties and organizations abroad. As a result, the emerging hawk chapters in France or the US were inclusive of Armenian workers, members of local communist parties and progressive movements, but overall competed aggressively against other Armenian organizations abroad for extending their influence over the Armenian migrant populations and the new generation of Armenians. In doing this, the hawk activism often caused tensions, conflicts, and even with those Armenian organizations who remained supportive of the Soviet Armenian of the Soviet regime in Armenia, regardless of ideological differences. The Soviet Armenian leaders did not call these positions a diaspora policy. However, I argue that in their targeting many influ influential Armenians abroad and in their active involvement in the diaspora through the chapters of Hoke, the leaders in Yerevan pursued state-centered, exclusivist and aggressive diaspora policies, which had a lasting impact on institutions and the lived experiences of people in the post-genocide Armenian diaspora. Thank you.